the scientists who keep at it <laughs> and keep trying to tell us what's going on. And so maybe you can tell us what you're at. What you're at. So Karen called me um, about, what, a year ago or so? Yeah, last summer. Um, because I published a paper that did what basically they said in the play, which was talking about how the rapidly changing Arctic system, and part of that is, is the loss of the sea ice, um, the facts that were spoken in the play are true. Um, as of last summer, the amount of ice on the Arctic Ocean was half of what it was only 30 years before. And if you take into account the thickness of the ice and the extent of the ice, so that you get the volume, there's only a quarter left as of last summer compared to only 30 years ago. This change is happening unbelievably fast right before our very eyes. And Karen read our paper um, that connects this rapidly warming Arctic, the Arctic's warming two to three times faster than the rest of the northern hemisphere, and how that rapid change is affecting the jet stream. The jet stream is this very fast moving river of air over our heads down here at mid-latitudes where we all live, and the jet stream is what controls our weather. These big waves, these north-south waves that maybe you've seen on the TV weather um, show at night, are what create the storms. Those waves create the high pressure, the nice weather. They, make, they decide whether it's cold or warm where you are. And so as we see the rapidly changing Arctic affecting these patterns of waves in the jet stream, what we're seeing is these waves are actually getting larger in the north-south direction. And when those waves get larger, they tend to move more slowly from west to east. And that means that the weather that they create is also moving more slowly from west to east. And what that means is that the weather that you're experiencing at any given time is changing more slowly. And so it makes it more likely that we're going to see the kinds of extreme weather events that are associated with persistent weather conditions. So you can think of droughts. We certainly had our share of those in this country the last couple of years. Think of heat waves. Think of snowy cold winters. Um, here on the East Coast, last winter was very cold and snowy, but the year before was just the opposite. And that's because these large waves in the jet stream just happened to be located in a different spot, but they were moving very slowly. So this is what my research has been talking about, and this is what Karen read and called me just out of the blue, and we talked for a long time, and... Um, I just want to compliment her on wrapping so much complexity and portraying this complexity of the climate system and weaving it in with all the complexity of human nature um, that we're dealing with. Um, and the way that she's talked about what's happening with the science and the scientists and uh, trying to get the message out about what's really happening in our, in our climate system. Um, I think she's done it masterfully in a way that I was completely enraptured and um, I truly hope that this play is produced and I was kind of hoping Steven Spielberg might have been out there because <laughs> I see it on the big screen but um, I, just, I just think you've done a wonderful job and so, so um, if any of you have any questions um, that I can help you understand or answer better. I, I talk a lot to uh, public audiences trying to take the complex science and the complex interactions that I study in my research and make them more understandable so people really do um, make this connection. And I know it's in some ways Mother Nature is helping us out here because it is so easy to see how fast the Arctic ice is disappearing. You don't have to be a scientist to see how fast it's changing. And I think we're all becoming much more aware of these extreme weather events that are happening more frequently, not just here in the United States, but all around the Northern Hemisphere. So I think, I think the conversation is really starting to change. I think people are understanding that this extreme weather that we're experiencing now really is connected to our own actions in terms of uh, building up the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So in some ways, um, I think it's 
kind of easier for people to understand because it's not just this concept of a gradually warming environment because you know that everybody kind of goes well that doesn't sound so bad but if it's if we're seeing these extreme weather events and we're able to connect it back to our own behavior then I think the message is going to become clearer and hopefully we'll actually see something start to be done about it. Yeah, there's a question. Could, uh, could, could yeah, there's a question behind you, George. Oh, sure. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Um, first of all, fantastic play. Just wonderful. Thank you so much for writing. Such a beautiful and very moving play. And I, my question really is that uh, uh, what I've been hearing from a lot of scientists is that the climate and weather are very far apart and it kind of no, no, dear, you don't really understand the complexities of this. But what I'm hearing from you is that, um, no, as with um, my intuitive sense about it, they're very much related and that we can trust what we're seeing and experiencing. I went to a... Um, uh, a, a, a conference on climate change at the New School that was filled with NASA scientists. And some woman got up to the microphone and said, what about all these changes in the weather? Is this climate change? And the scientists said, well, no, not necessarily. Right. So I'm wondering if you could address both of those points and um, tell me if I am naive or if there is something going on that we can understand even if we're not NASA scientists. Right. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean. Up until very recently, scientists have been very reluctant to attribute any extreme weather events or any weather events period or any changes to the climate system changes. And it's only been very recently that there have been enough studies that have come out that have been able to statistically, I mean, we can never say that this particular event would not have happened without climate change, but statistically now we have enough of a record in the real world to be able to, to look at what's been going on and know that there is a change in some of the types of extreme weather events. We do know that there are certain things that are happening that are unquestionably related to climate change. I mean, sea level rise is one. We absolutely know that for sure. We know that storms now, any storm at all, is now working with a lot more energy in the system because the atmosphere is warmer, heat is energy. There's about 7% more water vapor in the atmosphere. Water vapor is also energy. It's the energy that hurricanes access to develop their powerful winds. And so this water vapor and the heat in the atmosphere combined make any storm that forms now stronger than it used to be. Those are not uh, disputed facts. What is less certain at this point is this relatively new um, hypothesis connecting um, things like the Arctic change. Um, there are other changes in the tropics, for example, that may also be affecting the jet stream that are also related to climate change. But these are all still very hot topics of research right now. And I think there are a lot of scientists who think that it makes a lot of sense and there are a lot of other ones that are still not too sure and they're not ready, ready to commit. But um, what we do have at our disposal, and it was mentioned in the play, are these very sophisticated computer models that basically simulate all of the processes that happen in the climate system. They're really quite amazing. Um, they do everything from simulate cloud formation to precipitation formation to the ocean currents to changes even in the vegetation on the <coughs> land and how all of these things will respond to increasing greenhouse gases in the, in the past and also going into the future. So as these models get better and better, we're able to make better and better predictions about what's coming but we're also better able to connect the dots between individual weather events and the, cl the changing climate system. So it's kind of a stay tuned answer. Um, I think more and more scientists are on board with making these, these connections now between the changing climate system and, and weather events, but it's, it's a rapidly evolving um, discussion. Yeah. How, do you how do you maintain your hope? How do you maintain your hope? You Good question. I mean, I saw this in, in the play, but how, how do you, I mean, it's wonderful that you're doing this research, but in, in the face of all this, how do you maintain your hope? 
I get a lot of hope when I talk to audiences that have a lot of young people in them because they're all about, okay, yeah, 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 we get it. It's changing. Yep, stream weather's changing. Yep, yep, they're connected. Let's get going, you know? Let's do stuff, you know? Let's uh, make sure we don't use fossil fuels anymore. Let's figure out ways to not. And so I think the next generation is going to be so on board with um, let's get going. We, you know, we're, we've already committed ourselves to a lot more change in the climate system. We can't get around that. Um, but you know anything we can do to slow it down is going to help. Is going to help. How about in the way back? Yeah. In, uh, in your work, uh, there was reference to that key word that starts with an, with an A. That means it's human produced uh, climate change. Anthropogenic. Anthropogenic. <laughs> so there, there is an entity called the IPC. See, yeah, yes. you just shook your head good. So I'd like you to explain to this good audience what the scientists recently said about human-induced climate change. In the most recent report from the IPCC, yeah. which stands for the Intergovernmental Panel yeah, on Climate Change. A little bit. Um, yeah, well, you know, that report hasn't actually come out yet, officially. Right. So it's still being discussed and revised, and um, I know there was an article, thanks Today. to Karen for pointing it out to me, about this report that is in the works. Um, in today's science section of the Times, you should take a look at it. Yeah. 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 But, I mean, uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of scientists believe that humans are causing global warming and a whole bunch of other changes in the climate system. It, the problem is this process in the IPCC also involves a lot of politicians from a lot of different countries, and it's a negotiation about what this language is going to say in this report. And it's, it's not easy. I would not want to be uh, involved in one of the lead authors of that report, because it's got to be a very frustrating process, knowing that there's all this science that says one thing, and then there's people who do maybe don't understand the science as well as they should, or perhaps they have a whole other agenda wanting it to say something else. So it's a, it's a tough one, but uh, you know, the basic message is that in the coming report, it's going to say even more strongly that yes, humans are causing climate change. Yes, in the blue shirt. My name is uh, Eric Weltman. I work with an organization called Food and Water Watch, which is a mm -hmm. part of the anti-fracking uh, movement here in New York, and uh, very mindful of the fact that we've got the one-year anniversary of Super Sound uh, Sandy approaching. Mm -hmm. And sort of riffing off the first question, uh, and maybe perhaps the second as well, how comfortable do you feel, folks like yourself and your colleagues, how comfortable are you, you know, publicly you're know, talking about whether it's in op-ed pieces or maybe press events or rallies or otherwise, you're speaking to the public in those, you know, plain language, you know, terms that we talked about, you know, heard about in play. How comfortable would you feel like your colleagues and perhaps even yourself are in uh, taking advantage of the, you know, lim sort of limited window of opportunity we have to really make a dent in this problem? Do you mean in terms of Sandy in particular? Or or? Sandy in particular, but, but just more generally, is this... I mean, I understand that, you know, scientists typically don't feel like their place may be in the, you know, the bully pulpit uh, at press events or rallies or in op-ed pages, but is that something that you feel like, given the urgency of the, of the problem, that scientists are sort of breaking out? More and more, definitely. No, no doubt about it. I mean, I'd never done anything like this before <laughs> my paper came out. And it, I saw it as an opportunity. People were listening. Um, Media. I, mean, I get several calls a week from various um, media people all around the world. And I've done a bunch of uh, TV documentary type um, contributions on camera, off camera, on the phone. I've been on the Weather Channel, I don't know how many times. I mean, all of a sudden, everybody is listening. And so, and I'm not alone here. There's a, a lot of people I know who are also being called and interviewed and asked to make a, to say how they what they think about things. And I think we're becoming much less um, reticent and much less um, of the mind of oh I'm going to stay in my office and I'm just going to put that science out there. You guys do what you want with it. I think that day is over. Um, there are some people um, like. Um, 
What was his name? Frank? No, Frank. No, Frank. No, John? John. No, John. In the beginning of the yeah. show, where yeah. he was like mumbling a bunch of scientific terms and things like that. There are some people who kind of can't get out of that mood, so it's probably best not to have them, you know, out on the front lines, but, um, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of scientists who are actually very good at, at speaking and at connecting to audiences that are not, you know, science-based audiences, so um, I think it's totally changing and I think we all recognize that this is something that we just have to do. Yes? Um, I noticed that there was a speech by John towards the end about the need for a revenue neutral, revenue neutral carbon tax and I'm part of a group that's lobbying for that, oh, citizens good. private lobbying. I'm wondering where you got that message from. Uh, it's, uh, James Hansen uh, has said that and other people have said that, like your, your group. <laughs> so uh -huh. it seemed as though something that, uh, you know, could, uh, could reach people, that it was uh, like renewable energy, which is uh, another big part of the solution in the play, uh, that the carbon tax, I mean, because it's true, the fossil fuel companies are not being tasked, taxed, uh, and we're paying for the... For Externality. The, yes, right. <laughs> uh, so that if, if we did have a carbon tax, renewable energy would come economically very much within reach. You, you know this better than I. And, and that seemed, I wanted to offer, uh, Jana asked about hope, I wanted to offer some concrete uh, things that we could do, and I think the scientists and others uh, in this room, too, are thinking of what, what can we do that's actually concrete. Uh, the news is horrible, but the news is not uh, the only thing. We, we are creative people. We can, we can create a new way of, of dealing with this. If, if you yeah. don't give people hope, they just become depressed. Yeah, 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 something yeah. And, and I think that's the story of the play, I mean, this roller coaster that we're all on, mm -hmm. where sometimes it's so depressing, and then you wake up the next day, and you get back to work, and you, you, you know, you, you figure out something else to do. We, we have to. Yeah, Jamie. On that note of hope, I keep hearing that if we reduce uh, CO2 emissions 80% by 2050, that we can start to get things back in whack. There will be delays in the system and so forth, but we can... Um, put things back in whack over time. Is that uh, data that you're looking at that you would agree with? Um, I mean, it is, you know, physically possible to slow things down, but if you look at what's happening in the world today, the amount of, we set a new record last year for the amount of emissions of carbon dioxide that were oh, I know. put yeah. into the atmosphere. If and there's, we were to do that. If there was some way to do that, it's and if there was some way to actually extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Increase I mean, sequestration. The, or something, yeah, whatever. I know there are a lot of people working on this, so, and a lot of really smart people, so there's, it's possible. That I think it's good to say that yeah, yeah, as yeah. often as possible. <laughs> yeah. As if it's possible, then, like the kids say, yeah. let's just do it. Then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Yes. Um, two things. Yes. Um, first of all, a lot of the less progressive scientists use the idea of the little ice age, which is a naturally occurring phenomenon a couple of hundred years ago, as uh, an example that this is a natural thing and that it will re orient itself and turn itself back again in the future. I know, we don't believe that, but the point is that it is a documented thing 500 years where the temperature fell, the ice sheets grew, and Europe and probably elsewhere in the world was much closer. So how do we, how do we fight against the argument that our own geographic or geological history is giving us that it will enjoy it can change not over tens of thousands of years but over decades or hundreds of years. Well, obviously the climate system has changed in the past. Everybody knows that. We know why it changed. We can use those same climate models that I described to actually reproduce those changes, knowing about things like volcanic eruptions and the um, oscillation of the amount of energy that comes from the sun and all these different natural things that happened in the past, including changes in the Earth's orbit. So we know about all that. We know what caused them. And we also 
know that what's happening now is very different. There's no way that you can get a climate model to simulate the, the past 50 years of temperature change on the globe without making the greenhouse gases increase as they have. So, yes, it's changed in the past. Yes, we know that, and we know why. But we also know why it's, it's changing now. And it's a very different situation. Yeah. We've never put so much, we've never put poison in the atmosphere at this rate. So fast. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. should we want to say yes? Hello. Hi. So, <laughs> so, let me put so, my pick up. Uh, someone sent me a link mm -hmm. to uh, a scientist who was lecturing um, on a video. It was videos. And I can't remember exactly the name. However, this scientist seemed to believe that part of global warming had to do with our entire solar system warming because of the sun, the age of the sun, and the actual sunbursts. And that, it, it, does, that have any, does that enter any of your studies or consciousness at all? I've had people call and say, I know what's going on, and it's because the Earth and the Moon are getting farther apart. Um, I mean, there's some really bizarre ideas out there, and I'm sorry, that one is just not. You know, the truth is different. that a lot, there's a lot invested in fossil fuels. Most pension funds, uh, people who have stock portfolios, they're holding Exxon and Chevron and, and you know, they're holding, and so there's a lot of money being made off of fossil fuels because they're not being taxed at an appropriate rate. And, you know, all of this, much of this, uh, these theories, these kind of bogus theories, are meant to take us off the track of the fact that it's fossil fuels that are the real problem. And we have to stop burning them. We have to stop taking them out of the earth. And we especially have to not take the most dangerous fossil fuels, the, the oil in the Arctic, the, the natural gas, so-called natural gas, because that's just adding, if I may say, fuel to the fire. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> it's kind yeah. of ironic, too, yeah. that the yeah. ice would disappear and yeah. expose all this. Yeah, the ice goes away, and what you want to do is drill right. instead yeah. of mourn and figure out how to put the ice back where, where it belongs. So a lot of what's being said is, is, not, is just not true, but it's comforting to, to believe it, and therefore it's easier to believe that it's natural forces and, and not what we're doing. Because that means we have to change what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, like getting the door not to slam. That's <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, can I ask a question? This is a crazy question, but we had dinosaurs once, mm -hmm. and they all disappeared off the earth. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the conditions and a possibility that we could also, once again, with all the things we're doing, is there a possibility that genes reform and create the these things again, or is that just something that's already eradicated, wiped out of the world, doesn't happen again? Some things don't come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can't see a path to having dinosaurs come back. Right, so in other words, that was, that was some, something that just disappeared forever, which gives, uh, I mean, there's a potential for us in, under certain conditions to just you know, whoever, disappear. Yeah, sure. And whoever said 500 years for the Ice Age, I mean, how long have we been burning fossil fuels? 100 years? Yeah, yeah really yeah. since the, not even. I mean, yeah. it's really since World War II that we really since, started putting yeah. out in yeah. large quantities. So we are affecting the, the atmosphere at a much quicker, faster mm -hmm. rate than any natural change has ever happened. <coughs> More and faster. Yeah, Joe. Do you anticipate a uh, massive migration? Of? Either away from sea level and further north. Of people, you mean? Yeah. Well, in some places they're going to have to. Florida. <laughs> um, a lot of the Pacific Islands that are just atolls. Um, you know, anywhere that's, say, within a couple of feet of mean sea level is, by the end of the century and maybe even sooner, are going to see water not only coming into their living space, but uh, encroaching on their fresh water supply. Um, and you know, it's not just the gradual rise of the sea, it's whenever a storm comes along, it's riding on a higher level as well. So whatever waves would have come with that storm are now that much higher up. So it's kind of a compounding problem in that way. So you know, there is going to have to be some movement of people. Because I don't think we can build infrastructure to keep the, the ocean out.
How about going north as it gets hot? <laughs> probably see some of that too. Yeah, I probably will. There, there are already studies being done. Um, uh, Christian Parenti's book, um, uh, Tropic of Chaos, that connects climate change to violence. Because, of course, drought, uh, and the drought actually is one of the causes of the Syrian civil war. Um, there was a long-lasting drought in Syria, and Assad didn't do anything to mitigate the, the problems of the, of the farmers, and they rose up against him. That was part of the start of the civil war. So we see in many ways how climate change affects violence, and that pattern is, is also going to continue. Um, it's not, you know, everything is connected, in, in fact. Here's my question. Um, well, first of all, uh, I was, it's kind of two parts. One is, I was wondering if you could comment on the, um, uh, the pedophilia and the sexual oh. uh, the violence of, of, of one of the characters. That's one part. And the other is, I was very intrigued by the uh, suggested transgender um, mm -hmm. Aspects of the younger character, mm -hmm. uh, of the, of the young girl. It's just wondering if you. Yeah. I, I I appreciate what you're saying, but I also have dramaturgical questions. <laughs> yeah, no, no I, playwright. Um, so, yeah. I'm, I, and Nesta King's way in the back of the house there, and she and I are old eco feminists from. <laughs> we're not so old. We're, we've been doing, you know, yeah. but 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 you know the awareness of the of the fragility of the earth and the awareness of the situation of women <coughs> on the fragile earth came together in the 80s. I mean, that was, that was an awakening. Uh, so I think, you know, in some way, um, and of course many indigenous peoples who care more, take more careful care of the earth, women are more empowered in those tribal systems often. Um, so there, there is a relationship between women and nature. And the, the way that we treat women, at, at, or have treated in the past, women as expendable items or just the people who produce children, we treat also the, the earth as you know, just the thing that gives us food, and <laughs> just the, the endless source of, of, you know, what we need. And we don't, we don't realize we're in a reciprocal relationship with the Earth. Um, and so I, I think the, the two go together, and, and the Frank, as Frank gets more desperate, because I agree with Jennifer that the conversation is shifting, and people are beginning to wake up. And as Frank, the, who's presenting the fossil fuel, let's get a re last ounce of, of money out of the earth. It's really about taking money out of the earth. Energy is money. Um, as, as he becomes more desperate, he also becomes more rapacious, as Uncle says. And he goes after first Rebecca, and then he goes after Annie in the sense of, I can have whatever I want. So that's you know, sort of where that, that comes from, the, the connection of, of women and the natural world. And there, there was an important book written in the 80s by Carolyn Merchant called The Death of Nature, which talks about how Newtonian science, uh, you know, distanced nature from humans, <laughs> and nature became something just to exploit. And I think the climate scientists are reversing that trend. They're seeing, they're seeing the, the, the interconnection again between humans and nature and trying to put back a holistic, a holistic view. So Frank represents that dualistic view of I'm better than you, I can have what I want. Um, Annie represents, you know, gender shifting and bending, which is becoming more, I mean, people are becoming more able to, to change gender, to, to feel that gender is a, is a fluid uh, thing. It's not, not binary, but it's, you know, through continuum. continuum and through one's life, you can explore different gender realities, different sexual realities. It's also true that atrazine <laughs> does have a feminizing effect on animals, frogs, <laughs> most of the research. And so that all, it just all sort of evolved from that. I can't believe how many things you wove into this play. It was like, whoa, <laughs> like every single issue out there was in this play. <laughs> John Kerry. Yes. <laughs> no, no. Thank you so much. Well, well, thank you guys. We'll thank you.